everyone. Sorry for the lateness of this video. I accidentally deleted the first one that I made, so I have to make another one. So anyway, I wanted to go over the, the mock exam that you took in class today. Talk to you not only about what the answers are, but a couple, a reminder of what you need in order to get the achieved merit and excellence. So this one is based on sign. We're going to look at identity number one, and it says that a sine equals a cosine. Now, when it comes to looking at the problems and knowing what to do, always graph first. The first thing you need to do all the, every time is graph it. So when you graph these two, you'll notice they're both waves, but they are not on top of each other. So it is a sometimes equal, excuse me, they're not a, completely on top of each other. So it is a sometimes equal scenario. So for sometimes equals, you do particular solutions and general solutions. And that's a note you can write on your uh, formulas page if you want to. Please remember that you must write that you're finding the particular solutions from negative pi to pi. That must be on your test. And then just list out your six or however many crossing points that you are. Make sure you go to 4DP at least. Then the general solutions are, are next. And when you're thinking about working general solution, then this one is the harder one. Um, Remember that you've got to either, number one, change them both to the same trig function, or number two, turn them both into a different trig function together. Now, when it comes to sine and cosine, if this was sine squared and this was cosine squared, it's very simple to turn one into the other. However, when it's a single sine and a single cosine, you can't do that. They have to be some way to put the two of those together. You want to create either sine, cosine, or tangent. So if you're given a sine on one side and a cosine on the other, the best thing to do is to divide both sides by the cosine, which will turn this left-hand side, since the brackets are the same, into the tangent of the bracket. So you have the fraction in the front, tangent of the bracket equals just the constant on the right-hand side. Then you multiply both sides by the reciprocal of the 1 over root 2, which is root 2 over 1, you then get tangent equals radical 2 thirds. You must get the tangent by itself, or you must get the trig function by itself, before you start doing the theta alpha thing. So, you have tangent of the bracket equals the radical 2 thirds. You could go ahead and change this to a decimal right now if you wanted to. It's more accurate, however, if you leave it as a radical. And you could also write radical 2 over radical 3 separately if you wanted to. All right, remember the steps from here. Theta is always the bracket. And then you set the right-hand side equal to tangent of alpha because the left-hand side is tangent. If this was a cosine, you would put cosine of alpha. So tangent of alpha equals the radical. So alpha equals the inverse tangent of the radical, which is this decimal right here. Then we continue. You go to the general solutions on your formulas page, the big one. Look for the one for tangent. It's the one that says, and I'll go ahead and write this down, theta equals n pi plus alpha. And so from there is where I got the next line. Theta is this, n pi alpha right there. You do not have to write the formula. I just wrote it to show you where that line came from. Then start peeling away the layers to where you get x by itself. Move the pi over 4 over. Write it as minus here. Divide everything by 3, and you get n pi over 3. This divided by 3 is this. This becomes pi over 12. You can go ahead and combine these two together because of the fact there is no plus or minus. If there's a plus or minus, you're not allowed to do that. So personally, I prefer to just keep them separate because one term has a pi in it, one term does not. So that is your option at this point. <clears throat> That's the end of the first one. For the second one, I have... The sign again, and then a mess on the other side. Chances are, if the other side's a mess, it's probably going to be the always problem. So, put in the calculator. When you put it in, you, it, it, you write down, using the calculator, the graphs appear to always be equal. So we kind of have to prove that. And we prove it graphically, and we prove it algebraically. The graphic way is to do the equations to features on the left, graphs to features on the right. So, from the equation, make sure that you factor out the three, to create your correct C value, list your A, B, C, and D. D 
D is zero this time because there's no number added to the end. Then list your four values right here. Simplify if necessary. Please remember that C changes sign. It is a negative value because it was a plus in the, in the bracket. When you do the right-hand side graphs to features, remember you need two maxes and you must have the min between the two maxes. You cannot pick necessarily the very first min. You must pick the min that is between these two, otherwise you will get the wrong answer farther down the road. Remember you're trying to make your four values here match these over here. I believe it's easier to start with the vertical shift. The vertical shift is when you take the y values, because it's vertical, take your max y value and your min y value and average them. So you add them together, divide by 2, and it becomes 0, which is what we want. The amplitude is the distance from the mid, or the vertical shift, up to the max. And so it's the max minus the vertical shift you just found, high minus min, which happens to come out to be this radical, which is what I want it to be. Period is max 2 minus max 1. You can write that on your formula page as well. Max 2 minus max 1. You're doing the x values. When you subtract them, you get this decimal, which happens to be 2 pi over 3, because that's what I want. And then the horizontal shift you must designate if you're doing sine or cosine. For those of you who are not sure which one to do, it has to be the one that's on the left side of your original equation. The right side has a bunch of stuff. That's the equation you're working with. So when the horizontal shift is sine, because of this problem, remember that you have to take, like I showed you on the board, you have to find the average between the min and the second max, because that's the point where you want to find it. So you take the min, the second max, add them together, divide by 2, you do come up with the negative pi over 12 that it's supposed to be. So you have now graphically proven that these two graphs are always equal. Now for the proof. This is a very involved proof. So, as I said in class today, on these problems, always, always, always start with the left-hand side. So take the left-hand side, use the A plus B format. Sine of A plus B is sine A cosine B plus cosine A sine B. Write it out. That's your first step. Then the ones that are pi over something values, go to your single page formula chart, find out what those are, plug them in. I have a 1 over root 2 out front. If I distribute that, it makes a 1 half sine of 3x, 1 half cosine of 3x. Now, I do have a leading coefficient that's the same. I did this with some of you where I factored out the 1 half right then. This time I just wrote it out this way because I did this one earlier. Notice that the right hand side, let me go back, the right hand side is single x, it's single x, single x, single x, single x. This is 3x. So I have to break this down into single x's and the only way you can do that is to change it to 2x plus x because I have a double angle formula. This will just become the single x I want. Double angle, single x. So we do to this line here what I did to this line here. Sine A cosine B plus cosine A sine B. Now, at this point I factored out the one half from the whole thing. Then I have cosine A cosine B minus sine A sine B. So you write that out. This is the point where things start getting kind of hard. So knowing to ch what to change things to. Sine of 2x only has one choice. You write it down right here. All right, so it's 2 sine x cosine x for this, and then this cosine x comes straight down. Now for cosine of 2x, it's kind of tricky as to what you do. You kind of have to play with it to know that it's supposed to be this one that you choose. And for this one, that it's this one that you choose. So you change this cosine x to 2 cosine squared minus 1. And then you get a sine of x here. And then you change this one to 1 minus 2 sine squared, and you get a cosine here. Well, why did I do that? Well, I needed to have a single sine and a single cosine down here. 
And so I wanted to do something where when I distributed in the one, it was going to make a single sign. When I distributed in the one, excuse me, to distribute it in the cosine, I got a single cosine right there. And then this one, you had no option, you know, had no choices. You had to do it exactly as it's written. So then clean it up. Half times two makes the one sine and cosine squared. I am distributing both the one half and the sine backwards into here. So one half times two is one. Cosine squared was sine. And notice that these two terms are exactly the same, so I can combine them. Part of the reason that they chose this one. Then the one half distributed in times the one, and then times the cosine is the one half cosine x here. One half times the two makes this a one, and I'm left with this. That's this right here. And then one half times the two here is a one. I'm left with this right here. These two are the same again. So these two here combine to make this. There's two of them. These two at the back combine to make this one. Then I have this term come down and this term come down. Now, how do you clean it up from there to what I want? You take the ones with the squares and you pull out a common factor. They all both have a two. They both have at least one cosine. They both have at least one sine. So you pull out one of each. That leaves a cosine minus a sine. Then here, I can pull out a half. I do plus because that turns this around and makes this bracket match this bracket here. When those two brackets match, you pull it out as a common factor. The leftovers, the two sine cosine plus a half, goes in the back. There's my right-hand side. I am done. Make sure you summarize here that the functions are always equal. All right, finally. Number three, I know for a fact that this is going to be either a sometimes or a never. So this one happens to be a sometimes because it's a wave and a line. That's a line. When you put it in the calculator, you'll notice that they do cross. Please make sure that your calculator, if you're going to put this in and it gives you just a little bitty, let me show you, it gives you just a little bitty radical like this instead of a radical that grows as you type in your values, that two must be in a bracket before you do the divided by three. Otherwise, it's going to create a scenario where they do not cross. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, there is never a never equal in this test. So as you do this, if you graph it and you get a never equal, something's put into the calculator wrong, and you need to fix it. All right. So because it's sometimes equal again, we've got to do particular solutions. Remember the negative pi to pi? List them out right here. 4dp. General solution here, this is the easy one because it's equal to a number. So I've only got one trig function to worry about. So the first thing I've got to do is get rid of this. Multiply both sides by the reciprocal. Radical 2 times radical 2 is 2 over 3. Now we can do theta and alpha. Theta is the bracket. Sine of alpha is the other side. So theta equals sine inverse of that, which is this decimal here. Then we use our general solution for sine, because this is a sine problem. Theta equals n pi plus negative 1 to the power of n times alpha. So start peeling away the 3 and the pi over 4. Pi over 4 first. So 3x equals this times this. No, excuse me, this plus this times this minus the pi over 4. Divide everything by 3, x equals n pi over 3 plus negative 1 to the n. Dividing these two gives me this, minus pi over 12. And that's the general solution to this problem. All right, so now let's revisit what you need for achieved merit and excellence. There are basically six different things that are on here. Let's kind of go through them one at a time. We have particular solutions and there are two of them. One here, one here. That's considered one. We have an easy general solution. That's the second one. We have a hard general solution. That's the third one. Then we have these over here. Equations to features is number four. Graphs to features is number five. And the proof is number six. All right? 
So remember the rule, and I'm going to go ahead and write it on this page. Two skills is achieved. Any two skills. Now, if you're doing particular solutions, particular solutions, it must be both of them. They both have to be correct in order to be counted as a skill. Both count as one skill. So I can't say, I'm going to do this particular solution and this particular solution, and that's my two. No, it can't be that way. You've got to do two different ones. Four is a merit. So if you can give me four of them, it's a merit. Now, my recommendation are, number one, particular solutions. Number two, general easy. And three and four, equations to features and graphs to features. That would be my recommendation as to what to do. Those are the four easiest of them all. And then one, one error will get you excellence. Only one error in all of it. So if you get everything but the proof, you can get excellence. Remember that partial proofs and partial hard general solutions together might give you a considered counting one, but don't always bank on that. Always do more than you think you need. If you're, if you're going for achieved and you'll be happy with that, give me three skills. Do both the particular solutions, do the easy general solution, and do the equations and graphs to features. That way you've got plenty done. That way if you mess up any one of those, you can still get your achieved. And if you've done all four, you might still get merit. So it really doesn't matter at that point. Those of you who are watching this video, please remind me first thing in the morning that I need to show you something quick on the calculator about how to turn off a graph. Because when you're finding intersection, excuse me, when you're finding maxes and mins on your um, graphs to features over here, Sometimes it will not work if they're both on there, and there's a quick button push to turn off one graph so you don't have to delete the whole thing and you can do it. If you want me to show you how to do that, I will do it early in the, uh, right before we start the class. Remember that the test is spelled two tomorrow, so we can run into interval a little bit if we need to. All right, good luck to all of you as you study, and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.